So it's my distinct honor and pleasure to introduce our special visitor today um, to give us a distinguished lecture on revolutionizing healthcare. Navar is one of those luminaries who realized the power of technology and what is the power of how exactly it can be adopted and uh, used in the area of uh, healthcare and general promotion of health. And what is phenomenal about her work is she always takes the page itself as a course. So she can go from modern day applications to what the science and state of science and how we can improve the livelihood and um, uh, basically uh, the welfare of our patients that make the experience uh, a good place. Uh, Dr. Shara Navar is the director of Center of Biostatistics and Pharmacists of Boston Titles. He also uh, associate professor of medicine at Georgetown um, and published resilience of papers and received numerous awards and more recently number of uh, ROIs at Victoria Winston and NIH and uh, also our collaborator and working with us uh, on a number of uh, other things and we've been fortunate also to work as well on a number of imaging projects as well as collaborate on a very large and I found for the name of them. Uh, no further ado, um, let's tell you to welcome uh, Dr. Shar Navar, Noor Shari, and uh, um, let's get going with the lecture. Um, it's muted audio, so um, not sure. How about now? Can you hear me? Can someone on Zoom confirm that you can hear me better? Okay, fantastic. All right, thank you. All right, thank you, Elena. I can get started. So I'm going to talk with you and to you and not at you because uh, apparently you I'm talking to uh, leader, uh, leaders in the field. And so the title is much bigger than what I'm doing in healthcare. I'm trying to slowly uh, dabble into AI uh, and I'm using it very uh, uh, generally. Uh, so it's not really uh, just AI or ML. I'm using AI to encompass ML, NLP, DA, deep learning, all of the above. And so uh, what I'm going to try to do is truly uh, engage with you in a, in, you know, a historical kind of um, storytelling of how I started at, in healthcare and uh, where we are right now. I'm going to go over a um, couple of, if the slides start moving. All right. Uh, this is just a quick overview. I'm going to tell you a little bit about MedStar Health my organization, my department, and then talk about big data and the EHR. Uh, and I'll go over uh, how do we respond to requests uh, for data from our electronic health records and how does that look like? And then from there, uh, processes, use cases from the past and the present, and then a couple of examples of federal funding uh, in support of AI, ML, and uh, healthcare. So with that in mind, uh, this is MedStar. If you haven't heard of MedStar before, it's one of the largest healthcare organizations in the northeastern part of the country. We are all together 10 hospitals and over 300 uh, providers in the uh, DC, Maryland pr uh, predominantly. And we have uh, two institutes, the MedStar Health Research Institute and the MedStar Innovation Institute. We had around 6,000 full uh, practicing physicians and uh, around 33,000 employees. And we are the largest uh, medical education uh, offering more than 1,100 uh, residents and, and uh, fellows every year. Uh, our flagship hospital is the MedStar Washington Hospital Center. It's in the DC area. And we uh, serve African-American predominantly in that part. Uh, geographically, uh, our Georgetown um, academic partner we collaborate with investigators across the system, and my center resides in the MHRI. Um, I oversee um, around 30 PhD master level informaticians, biostatisticians, epidemiologists, and we engage in clinical and translational research. Uh, by virtue of the different hats that I wear, I'm director for the Biostats Epidemiology and Research Design Core for our CTSA for the last 13 years. And I'm also co-director for the biomedical informatics for our CTSA. I was commissioned to leverage electronic health records for research purposes 13 years ago. 
And I uh, was uh, fortunate to, um, you know, ask for a map of our electronic health records, which I'm going to show you in a minute. But basically, uh, I hired the right people at the time so that we can kind of look at our electronic health record and see how we can respond to the ever increasing number of requests to leverage electronic health records for clinical and translational research. And I was presented with a map. Uh, but at the time, data was increasing, exponentially growing. And I was told, you know, big data in healthcare will be the uh, largest uh, data that you will encounter. And it's true, it's very true uh, ever since we've been dealing with, uh, you know, uh, different sources and different amounts of data that is clearly uh, a little bit depressing when you look at this picture. So this is what I had to deal with 13 years ago when I was asked to leverage electronic health records for research purposes. We uh, at MedStar, every time we acquired a new hospital or new system, we brought their uh, electronic health records with them. And so we started to accumulate at 185 different uh, systems. Over 100 of them are clinical. Uh, this is what our electronic health records and others look like. And so when I was commissioned to do that, I had to really quickly learn how and which systems to use for what type of requests. Luckily, over time, uh, we kind of migrated and things started to look a little better. And in 2017, we uh, migrated into Cerner as a one system going to all. But if you are aware of how things work in the clinical and translational world, the question determines what type of data and how far back you have to go. So we still maintain a lot of legacy systems that we have to tap into for longitudinal studies, for studies, cohort studies that we need to uh, you know, identify for certain you know, questions here and there. And so each one of those requires a different level of expertise, different skill sets and so forth. And so this is in a, um, you know, at a glance, uh, the MedStar's pa patient population. We are considered a microcosm of the United States. We cover the gamut of like geography and, you know, uh, um, provider, uh, um, uh, payer category, I'm sorry, and the uh, number of beds and the, the uh, urban city, rural, et cetera. So by looking at our ethno-racial and uh, the, the university type uh, teaching, non-teaching, we truly are looked at as a microcosm of the United States. And we have the numbers. We are at 5 million unique patients with over 2 billion records. So we really are a, mine, a landmine of data to mine and to use for research and all of the above. So these are the different types of requests that we uh, usually get in my department. So the simplest ones, as you can see, cohort discovery. You know, a request comes through the door, no IRB, IRB approval is necessary. We provide numbers and then that would, uh, you know, give the um, request or the idea whether this is something to go forward with or to, you know, it's, there's not enough data to do a study and so forth. And then the most uh, requested are the limited data sets, which we can, uh, you know, go by with an IRB waiver and then the patient contact list, which requires a full IRB. So what is the process? This is just a quick uh, depiction of how the process in my department looks like. So a PI comes with a certain requirement. They submit a request uh, through monday.com, say, for example. And, uh, and then the uh, informatician, we have managers in four cores. We have the biostats core, informatics core, data science core, and clinical decision support core. According to the request, that gets triaged, and we review it. And then we identify the source data and the system that needs to be used for this specific request. And then we choose the proper tools, as you can see, to kind of work with investigators. So in my shop, unlike other places, it sits in the research institute. So we are not affiliated with IS. IS, you know, responds to everything else but research. And so if somebody needs data for research purposes, they come to my shop and not to the information systems or uh, you know, other places. And there we kind of start collaborating with the requester, with the investigators. We don't just give them data. We ask and we provide the analytics needed and the environment and so forth. And so it becomes collaborative in, in its nature and not 
a service. And so that's the process that it goes to. Uh, we make sure that the output is ready for delivery and then a statistician or an informatician can be assigned afterwards. We have the Hand Curtis Center, which is one of our, uh, you know, um, outstanding centers in the country, and they maintain their own registries and their own data that they like to use regularly for research purposes. And there is a process. We work regularly with them to provide the tools necessary and all of that. So this is uh, showing how within the Hand Curtis Center, we collaborate to make sure that the data is curated and uh, cleaned and put in ways that makes it easy for them to leverage research. And this finally, another um, study, large study that we are um, working on, Safe Baby, Safe Mom, is one of the largest uh, philanthropic donations to MedStar from the Clark Foundation to tackle the chronic uh, issue of maternal morbidity and mortality in the DC area. And we created a large consortium of collaborators from the community and MedStar to uh, approach it from so many different angles, including community uh, health, uh, pediatricians, uh, um, clinicians, family doctors, uh, midwives, and so forth. And we have established this particular uh, registry with taxonomies and everything that you can think of, uh, including social determinants of health, so that we can address the issue uh, of, you know, safe baby mothers and their children. So let me show you a couple of, uh, you know, use cases from the past. So initially, a pharmaceutical or a biotech would submit, a, a, you know, an interest to collaborate or to work with MedStar. And they have, say, for example, this is an example, a new biologic. It's a heart-lowering uh, drug that was tested in Europe, and now they are interested in testing it in the U.S. to see whether the patient pool qualifies to invest in this market. And so they submit a request. We go through our electronic health record. We identify the number of angina and of heart failure. And then we provide this uh, descriptive and they show interest. This particular one was of interest. So we went ahead and identified a cardiologist who would be interested in working with this team. And we moved ahead with this particular study. Uh, another study, this is uh, one of the uh, um, age-related macular degeneration uh, um, you know, diseases that's very rare and requires, uh, you know, mining the text in the in the EHR. So this was long time ago, and it was not easy to identify things that were not uh, quantifiable and did not have ICD-9s. So we had to run uh, a search in the, our entire, um, you know, EHR and identify very few cases. We were only finding 47. But even with that, given how scarce this uh, type of, uh, you know, issue, we needed to collaborate with multiple centers and 47 from our center was considered um, good enough to move ahead and be part of this. Uh, this is a retrospective study that showed the power of electronic health records in addressing something like hyponatremia and its association, independent association with osteoporosis and fragility fracture. Uh, the process by which we did this study a couple years ago, this is, um, you know, opened our eyes of what's needed and how we can actually uh, use the power and bring unleash the power in our electronic health records. If you can see here, digging deep into the electronic health records, we could we identified different levels of hyponatremia. So we divide, div, divide, divided it into prior, chronic, and recent hyponatremia, given the dates and all the details that are in the um, electronic health records for our patients, we were able to define and you know, dig deep into what our data looks like, how the data looks like. And so we create those concert diagrams for every request that comes through the door to show the final number of cases and controls, if this is a case match control. And as you can see, um, 30,000 is not a small number to do a study like this. Now at this point, up until this point, ML wasn't a thing, we were doing purely uh, conditional logistic regression matched, whether it's survival or, uh, you know, conditional uh, logistic, uh, we were not thinking about, you know, identifying the, the power of the, you know, the characteristics or looking at patterns. Or we had a specific question with a specific outcomes, and we created the data and arranged it in such a way that we get the, you know, the, the uh, hypothesis that we came up with answered. And so this is for the fragility fracture, 46,000 cases and controls. Again, this is a huge data set that is uh, available for this type of research. 
And as we, you know, do these types of projects, we match based on uh, lots of things, uh, age, uh, sex, duration of the patient in the records and so forth. And the study showed how significant everything with uh, prior hyponatremia, chronic and recent for osteoporosis and fragility fracture, as you can see here. We publish and, uh, you know, we do studies after studies. This is another one. Uh, a couple of years ago, it was a student's project that we did in the summer, and basically we wanted to tackle the issue of regionalization in cancer uh, care, uh, which is, you know, patients going to major hospitals to seek for uh, care. And we looked at uh, the difference in uh, taking into account age, uh, the ethnic and racial uh, factors, and then zip codes and income, uh, where zip code was used to identify the median income and college educated, um, you know, uh, graduates and so forth. And as you can see, uh, for older patients, we're less likely to travel from further pay, uh, distances to seek care in this major hospital as compared to younger. Uh, white patients are more likely to travel uh, longer distances and further distances to seek major, uh, you know, to seek care in um, the large hospitals that we uh, have. And uh, same uh, patterns have here. And so with the uh, distribution of race, you can see that white patients spread all over. They come from further places as compared to other ethnic uh, and racial groups in this particular. And again, this was published. But there comes a, a time when, you know, the data was exponentially growing and uh, coupled uh, or the confluence of big data and uh, supercomputing and cloud uh, AI found really a ripe environment to take off and everything around us, uh, you know, our healthcare is built on incentives. And so with incentives came the need to uh, use technology as much as we can to get answers in a way that helps us improve our patients' outcomes, our uh, patient provider communication, everything that you can think of that makes us, you know, uh, viable, uh, successful healthcare uh, providers. And so where are, uh, you know, the AI used in healthcare? Long time ago, reading data, you know, acquiring data from electronic or from actually, you know, the repositories was a daunting process. Surgeries are, you know, um, cause fatigue and, a bit, you know, our surgeons standing up and doing surgeries long hours uh, makes them prone to errors. And we, we saw that. And so with the new technology, we have lifted some of this redundant, tedious work from our surgeons, and we were able to kind of think about ways, creative ways to work with them and kind of, um, you know, do things that will help them do their and focus their work uh, on caring for our patients. And so these are a couple of studies that I'm going to go over that are co collaborations with multiple institutes. As you can see, University of Miami and us are collaborating on one study where we're using multiple um, machine learning algorithms to read uh, large amounts of images on uh, breast and lung cancer. And um, most of these, the first one and the last one are federally funded and I'm gonna go over them in a minute. Uh, so the first one is um, a study that was funded by industry and uh, it was a competitive study with other uh, organizations who had different systems. And so this is a um, random forest machine learning algorithm to detect characteristics that are associated with a condition called transthetherin uh, amyloid um, uh, wild type cardiomyopathy, uh, which is very difficult to detect um, just by looking at the data, but you can identify characteristics that are associated with it that flag these patients in the records and then takes them through a series of additional tests to make sure that they are, you know, free of this syndrome or they have it. If they have it, they qualify for this new biologic, new drug that, you know, lowers their uh, heart, uh, incidence of heart failure. And so we uh, collaborated with two other organizations and we embedded this e uh, random forest machine learning classifier in the back end of our electronic health records. And uh, that tool was, you know, validated and tested using data from IQVIA and from Optum. And um, the cases are defined and the controls are matched for age, sex, and duration and visits with heart failure, but not for amyloid, amyloidosis or amyloid-related conditions. 
And this is how the comparison looks like. So MedStar with Washington University and University of Utah, uh, we looked at the patients, we defined what the patients uh, inclusion exclusion criteria, and uh, we ended up with uh, this kind of um, uh, cohort uh, in each one of these hospitals. MedStar, we identified 53,000 patients who are who had heart failure, and from there. We looked at the combination of characteristics that existed. Uh, and as you can see, there are lots of similarities between the organizations. One um, uh, syndrome that was uh, I kept, uh, you know, captivating is the carpal tunnel syndrome. And so cardiologists were kind of surprised to see carpal tunnel in this particular exercise. But our orthopedic surgeons and doctors were not surprised because apparently when they see people with carpal tunnel, they know that these people are at risk of heart failure or they know that these patients have heart failure. And so they, you know, just by talking to different clinicians and showing the results, you kind of think that we're so subspecialized that certain subspecialties are not aware of what happens in other subspecialties. Uh, for this particular one, uh, this particular exercise uh, gave, you know, our cardiologists the window to see how can I identify patients who may have these comorbidities and kind of, um, you know, go through a certain decision tree, identify those who may be possible for ATTR and require further testing. And as you can see, the testing is a little bit involved. You have to go through AKG and echo and biopsy and then genotyping and so forth before, before you kind of uh, follow up with them. Uh, or ATTR is ruled out, so no further testing or non-ATTR, so you go directly to the infiltrative cardiomyopathy clinic. And so this is a clinical decision support that could enhance our ability to identify patients who may be at risk, and that's by leveraging the power of tools like this Random Forest ML classifier and uh, EHR. And so this is the publication from that particular study. Um, this study was very sobering. Knowing the statistics, and if you're aware of the issue of maternal health, in DC between the years um, 2014, 2016, 83 deaths in 100,000 live births occur in DC alone, as compared to 13 in white women, that's in black women, compared to 13 deaths in 100,000 live births in white women. In the United States, it's 20 deaths per 100,000 live births. These numbers considered really, really high given you know, the healthcare that we take pride in in the US. And so lots of, uh, you know, collaborations happen at the time between the time 2015 until now, the government, the communities, the hospitals, the people, uh, you know, raising awareness about an issue is the first step, but having federal and industry partners come together, as I mentioned a minute ago, the Clark Foundation invested almost $23 million in this, in tackling this. And we're working with them in addition to NIH. So this study was funded. I'm the PI of the study from NIH, working collaboratively with industry to implement a machine learning algorithm that's proprietary uh, called HopeCat to identify, uh, you know, the risk that risk factors that put our mothers who are pregnant at risk. And so we really uh, worked so hard to make it happen, for, and it was hard for so many reasons. First of all, the EHR has a lot of missing information, as you may know, and it's sporadic, it's spread out. The uh, data for uh, mothers in one place after delivery, it's in another place. And so we had to work across multiple systems and you know, bring all the data together. But that was all worthwhile. Uh, if you can look at this, we were able to identify mothers before the onset of worsening condition, almost 52 days, uh, earlier. And so if this is something that can flag mothers who are pregnant during pregnancy for one of these issues, whether it's heart failure or preeclampsia or some kind of severe and worsening condition, can you imagine what can be done early on before waiting and, uh, for these things to happen? And so something simple like that is really needed to prevent 
uh, issues in mothers who are at, you know, uh, who are vulnerable, to be quite honest. And so this is one of the projects that I, I take pride in because I see the results and um, I'm like, 53 days, we can definitely do th something uh, with these mothers. And so we are in the next phase of doing um, a little bit more. So we did this study. And after that, we were like, this is great. And we're identifying mothers. But I think we should dig a little bit deeper and see why are we getting to this point? And what are the social determinants of health and the environmental determinants of health that puts, put these mothers at a higher risk and what can be done in there? This is a very simple study that I've done a while back, uh, looking at the power of NLP. Again, our patients are seen in clinics across the MedStar hospitals. And if you're familiar with edge caps or with caps, uh, you know, these are questions, simple questions. What was the positive thing that happened today? What's the negative uh, thing? And our patients just write down unstructured text, and we had lots of them. And so what I did, we applied Python code to kind of come up with, uh, you know, the most negative thing that our patients experience. What do you think the most negative thing that any patient can experience in outpatient? You say that, something else. Anyone with a guess? I mean, what is the criticism these days about AI? Yeah, exactly. So empathy, lack of empathy. Number one was lack of empathy, no eye contact. Doctor was busy typing. That was number one complaint across our, and then, you know, wait time was number two. So you were not that off, but it wasn't number one. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and so this was uh, a great project because our leadership would act upon this. Once you see this information, uh, the data sat for years before anything meaningful was done on it. And now it's like a click and you do all kinds of analysis on unstructured text. And uh, this project was another project that when I submitted it, everybody was saying, there's no way you're going to get this funded from NIH. NIH doesn't even know what's uh, voice assisted or Alexa. And I got it funded in 2018. This was probably the first study that NIH funded to leverage Alexa to manage uh, patients who had heart failure. Um, and basically, again, conversation with a cardiologist in your hospital tells you what are the pain points. We really here are trying, I'm disease agnostic. I do not like any disease. I don't feel special to any disease. I hate all diseases. And so I want to solve all the problems in all of the diseases. And so being disease agnostic, you really talk to the, uh, to the clinicians and see what can help. Our heart failure doctors told us that heart failure patients can manage their disease easily if they are reminded to take their medication on a daily basis. And if they go to the ER, the minute they find out that they gained five pounds overnight or they're having shortness of breath. Like there are 10 or 11 things that, you know, if they check, check with their patients on a daily basis, they can prevent them from coming to the hospital or to the ER regularly. And so we took these questions and we, um, I applied and got the Alexa part funded. Now the uh, avatar part was basically something I pitched to a company that was in the business of developing avatars. And I said, would you be willing to take part in this study uh, and develop the avatar for us? And I can recruit patients to use the avatar. So that way we have this NIH study plus the industry funded. And they agreed. So they funded a third arm. They developed the avatar and they asked me, how do we need our uh, avatar to look like? So we said, you know, we pro predominantly serve our African-American patients and we consulted with them at the time. And they actually, I picked the hair based on feedback from the patients that we serve because we, I gave them like 10 different hairs and they picked this hair and they picked everything. So we trained Tara, we call her Tara, um, the avatar, and the Alexa on the series of questions. And the idea was to develop uh, a dashboard to monitor these patients. So heart failure is a common um, you know, condition which can be treated easily or can be managed easily. I'm sorry, not treated easily by just following simple steps. And the premise that I had at the time is to test the uptake uh, of this new technology in patients who suffer from heart failure, and uh, also to see whether that would prevent them from um, readmissions. 
So these are the two major uh, goals for this particular study. But honestly, I was at the time anxious to find out whether our patients would be open to using this technology. And to, um, you know, I was pleasantly surprised because only two or three patients from the hundreds that we tried to recruit for the study said, no, we don't want to use Alexa, the government eavesdrop on us. But other than that, there was a huge uh, enthusiasm about using technology in our patient pool from the heart failure clinic. And um, we randomly uh, assigned patients to Alexa and Avatar and uh, the um, standard of care. And so these were uh, developed using the, Ask, the Alexa skill kit. And um, we programmed, um, this is just the study flow and uh, how we uh, roll the study. So the three groups, and these are the questions that we created with our heart failure doctors. And so the first set of questions were compliance questions, and then uh, mild symptoms, and then moderate to severe questions. And each one of those triggered uh, you know, um, different series of questions. If you say yes in the first one, that's great. If you say no, it triggers um, uh, you know, another uh, question. Can you please weigh yourself? Or can you please not forget to weigh yourself? And uh, this is just showing how the data flow uh, from the time the patients use Alexa, where does it go, and all the way until it, um, you know, it's depicted and presented uh, visually on Tableau. Uh, this is for Alexa and the avatar, and this is how, uh, you know, the uh, Amazon RDS data is captured. One of the issues that we encountered is bringing the data uh, on a timely manner so that it can show like this and then it can basically uh, be presented um, in, in this dashboard, which is the tool that was managed by the heart failure nurse on the team and myself. So every time a patient answers a question, the first compliance questions, they turn into blue if the patients say no. So did you weigh yourself? They say no, it turns into blue. And so just looking at colors, you can manage large amounts of patients just, you know, quickly by, you know, seeing what happened. The second set of uh, questions, the mild uh, questions, they turn into orange if they say yes. If you, did you eat salty food? They say yes, it turns into orange. And so that gives an idea to the nurse um, that this patient is kind of, you know, not, not complying with what they're supposed to do. And then we told the patients, this is a research study. Do not rely on Alexa to take you to the hospital. You don't feel good, call 911. Alexa will not call 911 for you. Some patients didn't do that. And so we had to intervene because for two days, we have seen that they're saying lying flat, they still having a hard time breathing. And uh, they gained five to seven pounds overnight. And so we called them. And we kind of talked to them and we realized that they were really sick. And so we called their doctor and the doctor brought them to the clinic. In one instance, the doctor called us and said, this patient would have expired in a few hours. Thank you for bringing them. We managed their medication. Two months after that, it was green across the board for that particular patient. And so, and this is a small study. Think about it. This is only 30 Alexa, 30 Avatar, and 30 standard of care. If we're doing this at scale across the healthcare organization, identifying patients with heart failure who are having, you know, worsening condition, bringing them to the clinic, triaging and reallocating scarce resources to those who need it the most. I mean, how great that would be for you know triage concierge service and so this was uh you know a study that was an eye opener i didn't really think that we will see uh earth shattering results in terms of readmission or 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 you know but we you know the hypothesis was that managing these patients will prevent them from will prevent readmission it may not have been really true because when we identified these patients who didn't call 911, we brought them to the clinic. And so that shows that those patients with the tool had more visits than you know, we expected, right? But the reality is that we only brought those because they didn't do anything on their own. And it actually was a quicker visit than having to be hospitalized. So we kind of looked at those as well. The one thing that was significant between the two tools, this is a study that compares Avatar with Alexa, 
is the number of medications uh, to manage heart failure with a little bit uh, larger or higher number of medication in the Alexa group versus the avatar. On average, people used it uh, 37 times in one in avatar uh, versus uh, 31 or 32 in the Alexa. But overall, uh, this was a continuous, um, we asked them to use it on a daily basis over 90 days. Some of them actually used it um, 80 and above, but the rest were on average uh, 30 to 40 days, which is not bad if you think about it. And there are situations where the patients uh, forgot. And so we saw that they haven't filled it. We called them and they uh, invoked it and so forth. So there is um, potential for these tools to help us manage patients uh, and um, you know engage them with their care, empower them to take good care of themselves and so forth. And so we have two papers on the study uh, that we are um, we, and we are uh, you know, submitting additional studies to incorporate additional data to link the EHR into the uh, data that's captured from the Alexa to you know, uh, predict those who may be at risk. This is another study that's funded internally from uh, the NCATS CTSA at MedStar in collaboration with uh, other entities where we're looking at uh, the onset of diabetes uh, in a cohort of patients who have prediabetes within a period of three years. Uh, you know, it's no secret that diabetes inflict many Americans and, um, you know, 30% of those who are prediabetes today will have an onset uh, or an incidence of diabetes in three years from now. So we said, let's look and see whether there's a difference between patients and our system and uh, use the power of machine learning, NLP, and so forth uh, to um, you know, explain what's happening. So we designed the study, and we identified prediabetes as A1C between uh, 5.7 and 6.4. Uh, we had, uh, um, this is the workflow of where the data is coming from. We incorporated the EHR. We incorporated unstructured, semi-structured, structured. Uh, we looked at all kinds of uh, data that we can uh, get from the system. And uh, we had um, a diagram. If you look in, from the top, we identified 15,000 patients. Uh, and then we excluded those with uh, diabetes prior to the study, those who are under 18. We wanted to focus on adults only, missing labs, uh, individuals with records less than three years after the index date, and so forth. And we ended up with 5,000 uh, and um, 114 pre-diabetics between those uh, years. We're still working on the study, and I tell you why. Uh, in, in, um, we started the study in 2019, but we're still working on it uh, for the following reason, which I'm going to share with you. So with that, uh, we use the following methods. We used regularized logistic regression versus uh, SVM, classification trees, key nearest uh, neighborhood, and artificial neural network. And we compared them, and we found that uh, you know, the logistic regression was probably uh, better than the baseline methods that were used. As you can see, AUC is 0.775, which indicates better discriminatory power uh, for um, this. And uh, what happened is that while we saw that there is a difference between uh, black patients and white patients in the incidence of diabetes, we were not clear on what are the uh, you know characteristics of why that's happening. Is it uh, you know their clinical measures? Is it some other characteristics? Is it obesity? Is it what have you? So we digged a little further and we wanted to identify clinical, you know, information from clinical notes, the unstructured. And when we looked at that, we uh, identified four uh, characteristics that we looked at, um, diet, uh, alcohol consumption, smoking, and um, lifestyle in general, working out and so forth. And we found out that uh, patients uh, who were white patients, where had those four measures in their charts more than black patients. And so we were like, hmm, how come? So let's look at our physicians. So we ran two models of, you know, for the Bayes model, we can see that the white patients and the, uh, they, you know, they're more likely to have these characteristics. 
But when we incorporated the physician fixed model as a, you know, as a, as a factor in the model, that significance disappeared, which means within physicians, there's no significant difference between black and white. So if a physician didn't ask the white patient, they didn't ask the black patient. But across physicians, there was significant finding. And so if you can imagine all the, you know, research that's done in the past and how the power of additional data can augment our current understanding in the way that this did, uh, I, I think we have a lot of work uh, ahead of us to reckon with. And so these are the four uh, diet, exercise, smoking, and alcohol consumption. And these are the two models that we ran. And so now we're looking into incorporating something like this and um, you know, alerting our clinicians. If you have a patient who, ha who has prediabetes, regardless of color, regardless, you as a clinician should probably ask them about those four measures and let them know, raise awareness that, you know, lifestyle may enhance your ability to, you know, protect yourself from an onset of diabetes and so forth. So uh, we are hoping that with the power of data and the tools that we have access to, that we will actually empower our clinicians and our patients alike to take better control and uh, educate uh, one another. And at the end, uh, recently, um, I mean, for the last couple of years, I've been working diligently to kind of understand how we live, can live symbiotically with the new era of, you know, some people call it AI, ML, whatever, regardless of what it is, the technology is here and there are companies that are popping left and right. I get requests every day from one company here and there to kind of test their tools into our electronic health records. How do I know whether these tools can help us harm us, et cetera. So I think we have to befriend the AI and not be their en its enemy. And so with that, I continuously work on grants. This is my re most recent grant uh, on um, incorporating Alexa voice assisted with chat GBT to look at explainable symptoms in patients who undergo major cancer surgery, specifically GI. These patients have higher risk of being readmitted and they have higher risk of you know, worsening conditions and death sometimes. And so uh, we actually did get this funded and uh, we're gonna kick this study July 15th. And at the time, I, I think that this is probably the first study that NIH funded that has chat GBT in it for the, same, for the following reason. The, when we were responding to requests in December, uh, the, the, uh, the, the study was scored and the proposal was submitted and we had a fabulous score. We thought it's, it's gonna get funded immediately, but we uh, got a list of questions from, the, uh, from NIH to respond to. At the time when we were responding to these questions, ChatGBT was announced. And so we incorporated it. That's why I think it was probably one of the first, I don't know, but my hunch says that it's probably one of the first because we immediately got funded after we responded. And so now we have to figure out how we're going to use ChatGPT to do what we said we're going to do. But I think one of the things that our patients in the heart failure study mentioned is that they didn't feel that Alexa was uh, interactive. They say something and then Alexa, you know, responds in a canned way. They really wanted Alexa to speak to them. And to, so that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna uh, you know, create a tool that speaks to our patients and leverage the power of you know, how do we tease out meaningful information from the conversation and inform our clinicians to take action and come back and help our patients. And so uh, we are in the process of uh, creating the dashboards and all of that, discussing how it's gonna look like. Again, um, this is just the beginning and we have a long way to go and we need uh, to you know, collaboratively work with our uh, very you know, well-versed technical people such as your team, Elena and others to understand how we can incorporate this technology in an ethical, non-biased, way uh, so that we can uh, you know, do the right thing for our patients and our uh, providers. And so with that, I think I can stop and see if you have any questions. And if I may, um, these are barcodes that uh, you know, summarizes the work that I, I do and also promotes 
uh, a conference that I'm putting together this month at the end of this month on uh, artificial intelligence and health equity. Um, and so we have speakers from all over the country and we have workshops for the month of July. You're all welcome to attend. It's free of charge. And we're trying to promote, aware, raise awareness uh, on AI and in health equity in healthcare. Thank you. Yeah. I have a, a question related to uh, you mentioned about the uh, the, the, the uh, diabetes and um, risk factors for people with uh, pre-diabetes and uh, how there was a uh, difference. It seemed like in the prevalence of questions being asked amongst different physicians. I was wondering, was that study taken uh, across multiple hospitals? Yeah. And was that difference something where, you know, the physicians at one hospital were asking the questions and the physicians at another hospital maybe weren't? Was that potentially, you know, part of that? Yeah, exactly what she just said. Yeah, so it's probably geographic that the physicians who were seeing uh, patients, regardless of, you know, maybe they were in a hospital that sees predominantly um, black patients or white patients, they didn't ask a question across the board. Mm. For the same physician, these questions were missing. But yeah. if you look across the board, different physicians ask these questions. I see. Yeah, but within physician, there was no significant difference. So if a physician asked, they asked across the board. If a physician didn't ask, they didn't ask across the board of their patients. But but then, you know, one hospital has the same physicians, right? So could there be a, a concentration of, you know, physicians not asking the question in one hospital? Well, that's so, what we're going to look at. So geographically, do these things remain or disappear? I see. But the data usually will look across all of medicine. That's really interesting. I was also really fascinated makes the second question that now one has to do um with you were talking about the um the uh I forget exactly which condition it was during uh pregnancy but uh looking at um at uh potential causes of mortality and I was wondering how do you deal with a small sample size problem because you know you could have a lot of patients that maybe have risk factors right but then uh, there's relatively few patients that have, you know, a, a, an actual, you know, major event. So how do you, how do you do, do this? How do you uh, take into account, you know, that there's a, that there's a, that uh, you, you're kind of looking for a needle in a haystack or trying to predict a needle in a haystack? Well, that study was 34,000 patients. That's not a small number, but in the, in the, you know, context of machine learning, it is small, but it is being tested and validated internally and externally. This this machine learning was tested in California, and it's shown um, great results. And the results were kind of, I don't want to say replicated, but they were as good as the uh, the results that they've seen in the past. And so our goal is to implement something like this in addition to other measures and vetted and validated with time because there's no data that's big enough for anything. We need to really ensure that these work well across the board, right? But this particular study was 35,000, 32,000. Why? Yeah. Who were yeah. pregnant during the time. Now, in my opinion, it should be tested prospectively. This is all retrospective. So we, we know for a fact what happened to these patients and we kind of train the model there. The next phase is to test it, and that's what I'm writing now, is to test this tool prospectively and see whether it works well as today. That's one aspect that we might think about for the diabetes question is pre-diabetes wasn't really a diagnosis for internal medicine physicians until like uh, 2006 to eight, roughly. And so depending on when you train, you may or may not think about asking the questions about why it's dying. So an older physician at one of those hospitals would never ask those questions about diet, exercise, smoking, alcohol, even though you're kind of supposed to for a certain uh, clinical notes, um, it just might get overlooked in the pre-diabetic like once they hit diabetes, then you ask these questions. But the, the diagnosis of pre-diabetes is a, a newer concept. 
That's exactly right. uh, roughly like around, I think it was 2008. And then you can start billing for it. Now, the younger physicians who trained for residency from 2008 onward who are younger would be now more prone to asking questions. So if you go back and look at age, that might be a component. Exactly. That's, that's very, uh, it reminded me of another study that we did in 2010, I think. And we took training number of years in practice in Guatemala, but we didn't do that here because that wasn't after those, after we saw the initial results. We said we have to look and see whether our doctors are, you know, there's structural bias in how our, you know, doctors practice, or is it due to something else? So now that we saw that there's no significant difference within physicians, we want to know what is it? Is it years of practice? Is it geography? So I give you an we have two major hospitals that, are, that see different pools of patients, different sector of the you know the population. Georgetown, you know, it's high high socioeconomic, etc. Washington Hospital Center, you see a lot of Medicare and Medicaid and a lot of underserved, right? Almost Obamacare covered all of the um, you know reconstructive surgery, breast reconstruction after double mastectomy. And after the any mastectomy, uh, Georgetown, 100%, everybody gets reconstructive surgery for breast implant. Hospital center, the doctors are begging the patients to get it. Our patients say, we don't have childcare. We can't stay one more night in the hospital. I don't care for, for that. So the patients determine what they, you know, the, the kind of the pattern of care to us. It's not always from the provider side. Sometimes the patients imply what they want done to them. And the doctors tell them it's free. You get it for free. They either don't care for it or they don't, you know, have somebody to take care of their kids while they're spending one more night in the hospital or having to do the procedure some other way. And so sometimes we have to kind of dig a little bit deep and understand why are we seeing these differences across our hospitals? It might be implied by the, the patients. More questions? Thank you very much. It was a great talk. Um, very excited. Uh, in terms of handling the complex medical data from the EHR, such as sequential longitudinal data values you know so you might get a serum sodium on a certain day at a certain time for example i may get a lab every six hours on a patient um how do these or do these machine uh, ai or machine learning models you have here take that into account or not yet and that's something to be determined how best to handle so there are certain things that are easier to compute than others so i started my career looking at longitudinal business and the type and the pattern of misleadingness implies what to do with it. There are certain things. So I do it in my own research. With those machine learning, I think we had to drop some records in case one of the missingness is important. So we drop the whole record entirely so that we don't buy the data. But we are talking about computation techniques for the same reason. Uh, and so yeah, it's one of the things that we have to account for. Which techniques are you thinking about with computation? So, I mean, um, as a mixture, maybe, or some kind of like, you know, it depends. We, I, I advocate for, you know, um, multiple techniques, multiple see techniques to see how they improve. So, my two papers that are published on this compare four or five different techniques and it shows which ones work better for what type and what is the percentage of missingness is also uh, one factor that allows you to make a decision. But, yeah. It's, I'm Justin. I'm um, going to ask a non-technical question here. Um, in a couple of times during your talk, you mentioned um, private sector partners or industry partners. What type of industry partners are sponsoring the research uh, for for these different projects? Uh, so the ATTR, that's a very good question. The ATTR one uh, was Pfizer. Yeah, and they, okay, I mean, it's not uh, hidden. They developed this uh, drug uh, that, you know, was voice to treat this ACTR. Now, for them, it doesn't matter if we do research or not. Well, for me, I wanted to see how that works. And I I actually told them, if it's not going to be a research and we're going to publish, I'm not going to do it. But they agreed. They said, perfect. You can write the paper and all the So we did the research with that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you
Oh, um, a hospital, hospital setting, Rachel. It was in a hospital setting. Oh. Oh, so basically uh, using NLP to analyze patient survey was very simple. Uh, somebody in my shop did it. We used Python code to quantify and to find common themes in the answers. So we, we first identified the groupings of you know the, the negative things that were said. And then we lumped things that sounded similar. So we had to specify what we uh, uh, put together in terms of like lack of empathy, lack of eye contact, doctor was busy typing or writing or whatever. So we had to uh, train the model to put these together. Uh... How do you ensure PHI is protected while using tools such as? That's an excellent question. So I am notorious for stirring the pot and I'm constantly uh, having compliance and IRB call me and stop my study. They actually stopped the Alexa study emits. Um, maybe we were like a month or two months. Uh, it was stopped because they didn't initially understand Alexa in 2018, IRB didn't really know what's going to happen to the to the data in the cloud. And so after we got approval, um, something triggered and they stopped it. And so we had to give assurances uh, and talk to them about how we have a BAA with Amazon and that protects this relationship. And we had IRB and we had a data U, a U, a DUA and everything and all of the above. So every time I do one of those studies, if it doesn't have a precedent, I kind of work with our compliance officer and our lawyers to ensure that we have all the measures in place to protect us in case of a data breach or whatever. So we have a great team. We have more lawyers working with me than doctors in some studies. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I feel like I'm in good hands. And oftentimes I spend nine months dealing with regulatory and compliance before we um, kickstart the study. It's a big deal. It's not something to, to take e easy. I am very aware that uh, our patient's information is used in, in an ethical and um, secure way. Is, is SR1 IRB or all the systems? For no. example, I work at Jackson and also a new position, so I have to deal with two IRBs. It, it's a headache. It's a headache. We have a cancer IRB, and uh, and I, I think we have three or four, but I deal with one. And the good thing is that because of our CTSA, when we got the CTSA in 2010, one of the first things that we did is we created a CTSA, uh, an IRB that covers uh, the institutions that make up our CTSA, which are five institutions, MedStar, Georgetown, Howard University, Oak Ridge Labs, and the VA in DC. We don't cover uh, the VA, VA, no, nobody covers the VA, they cover themselves, but we cover Howard, Georgetown, and uh, MedStar. And so that IRB is probably the preferred IRB to kind of, if you're doing a multi-site studies, to use it, but our uh, IRB covers almost all of my studies from patients across the the. Now, if it's cancer, we go to another IRB in, within the organization. Oh. Uh, Delia, great talk. Do you, how do you handle errors in EHRs like coding mistakes? I have a great team who's been working with me for almost 15 years. They, they can spot errors like that. Having said that, we never take things for granted. So whenever we start to do, uh, you know, research, we we really uh, look very intimately about the data, and we engage with conversations with our clinicians. There are times when the numbers that we extract don't make sense to the clinicians, and we don't sit on it. We have to dig deep and find out why and how. Sometimes it's lab errors or lab measures that are different than what you used to see, or you have to go to another system or something like that. So yes, we do have 
uh, a very rigorous process in making sure that we are um, um, you know, obtaining the proper data and there's no place for coding mistakes. It gets capped, it gets code uh, across the pipeline of the research, whether it's, if it's not code at, you know, early on, sometimes by the time we look at the data, it doesn't make sense. We go back and we um, check our code and all of that. Now in my shop, there are always two people working on, uh, on things. And if, if they're coding, they kind of check one another's code. So really we take this very, very seriously. I have a question. Uh, yeah, here's my So since you mentioned um, a, a copper tunnel or syndrome, right? Uh, so I was wondering whether you did ICD-9 or ICD-10 codes, say association uh, study, meaning which, you know, codes appear together uh, in, say, it has a group, right? So any interesting discovery, sort of surprising discoveries? I'm just curious. Or in general? In general. I mean, not always when I come down. Mm -hmm. uh, no, you know, ICD-10 is a little bit more in depth. We have a million other codes than right. the one before, but we have this uh, algorithm that not, you know, helps us match uh, the codes together. It's not something that we have uh, explored as a, as a research project, but if you have a specific question, you can just let me know. But as far as I know, I think we initially when ICD-9-10 uh, was implemented, we had a lot of issues matching what, you know, what's here, what's there. But now I don't think that's coming up. I don't know about the doctors here. I don't think it's just detailed. Well, yeah. I got to talk about why we're going to I, I don't think we're seeing any issues. More questions? Okay, thanks again. Oh, my pleasure. <laughs>